Okay, today I'm going to do something called scan conversion. And this is kind of the last step you do in the whole process. And now that we know uh, in, in transferring things down to image space, et cetera, et cetera, this is the last thing you actually have to do. And uh, it's always been a problem to take um, something that you want to plot, well, basically if we want to plot onto a, something onto a window here and we want to plot this polygon onto this window, somehow we have to determine which dots, which pixels on the window actually intersect that polygon. Somehow this, this has to be determined. This has been going on for a long, long time that we have to have routines that allow us to figure out which dots are actually on the uh, uh, intersect the polygon that we have so that then we can take these dots, we can create colors for them, we can create depth for them, everything. But all we're given effectively is these, these four vertices of the polygon, okay? And we get them in image space and we have to figure out all the dots on the polygon and what are all the points on the polygon where they actually intersect, intersect effectively dots on the screen. And this is a process called scan conversion. And the scan comes from scan line. That typically you have various scan lines. And these are things of, we'll see, constant y value, right, in image space. These things of scan are called scan lines. And um, it used to be on that when you did graphics, you tried to mimic what happened on the TV screen effectively that, that you were working on. And the way analog TV screens effectively work is really a simplification, is they, they draw basically one scan line of material, right? And then the beam flies back, and then they draw another scan line of material, and the beam flies back. You have this beam drawing these, these things. Basically, it's an old oscilloscope almost, okay? And except going across. And, and uh, um, it used to be that it took maybe one third of the time, a thirtieth of a second, one ninetieth of a second to scan or write this data across and then it would take twice that long for the beam to fly back to write the next line. And during that period was when we had to do our graphics. And one, that one sixtieth of a second coming back 190th, 160th is 30th or so. 160th of a second coming back is when we had to actually do our work. And then we had to give up and put in the next scan line in memory and then it would write that out. And so we had to, we had to kind of synchronize what we were doing with what the screen was doing. One of the big problems then was that the TV screen normally does an interlaced pattern. Right? So it, did, it, went, it flew back, if it did scan line one, it then flew back and did scan line three. Then it did scan line five and went all the way to the bottom. And then it came back and did two, four, six, eight, etc. And so we had to be able to do things scan line by scan line. Well, you still do it today in a somewhat the same fashion. You do things scan line by scan line here. And you try to figure out the dots, basically where your polygon intersects these dots. Okay? And for every one of these dots here, they're actually little rectangles, for every one of these little things, we're going to calculate an x value, a z value, and everything. And the interesting algorithm is how they manage all this. Okay? And it's really actually quite simple how they manage all this, but how they manage it in scan conversion effectively equates to how we manage a lot of the algorithms. We'll use the same type of algorithms before. All right, so as a precursor to this, if you remember, we've got this object up here in space. We're looking at it up here. We transfer this thing down so that our camera exists on the negative z axis. I mean, we are all done this, and our object is kind of in here. And then we transfer that down until we get into image space. Y, z, x coming out at the board. And image space is minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1, where things are in here. Okay? And it can extend outside if we want. Okay? It doesn't matter. Can extend outside. I'm going to assume it doesn't extend outside the, we clip it away anything outside the x and the y boundaries of this cube. Disease could extend outside. Sometimes we clip it, sometimes we don't. Okay. But in any case, each one of our things in here, what we have is we have little polygons in here, right? We have little polygons in here. And they all have x, y, and z coordinates in here. Okay? And the x values are all between minus 1 and 1. 
And the Z values could be big, could be small, right? Normally they're also between minus one and one, depending on where, where near and far are, but could not, perhaps not. Okay, so, but everything is kind of smashed into this space. Okay, so those of us who love spaces, the very next step we do, what I'm gonna do the very next step, is I'm gonna transfer this into something called device space, okay? And device space is something that looks like this. And you can do this a ton of different ways. I'm going to say the bottom point down here is 0, 0. Okay? This is something called nx in 0. This is nx in y up here. Uh, and I just probably blew that. There should be a minus 1 on both these. Probably, no, let me, let me stop. Let me do it correctly. <laughs> okay, this is nx and 0, nx and ny, and this is 0 and ny up here, this top point. And so what we do is we put this onto a nice grid like this, which kind of corresponds to the window that we're going to write things on, okay? And this has, say, nx pixels this way, and it has ny pixels this way. And for this lecture, if I can, I'm going to assume that nx is equal to ny. Okay? All right. And the, the nice thing about this is that everything has uh, the sides of all these little squares is 1. Okay? And we're going to find that's a very nice thing for us. Um, you can do it uh, other, th other ways, but this is typically the way it's done. We transfer this now, this space into here. Now, it's really three-dimensional, right? It's really three-dimensional. Okay, and I'm not going to do anything with the Z values. The Z values are going to stay the same. Z values are going to stay the same. Okay? But now I'm, I'm going to start drawing this thing in these type of spaces here, okay? So what we get here is we get a polygon, okay? And maybe millions of them, maybe millions of polygons. And what we have to do, what we want to do is we want to enumerate all those dots here uh, that this thing goes through. I'll color that one too, I don't know. We want to enumerate all those dots I get them all? We want to enum kind of enumerate all those dots that this polygon covers. And these will be the pixels on the window that I actually have to color. Okay? And usually we try to find one um, point on these pixels and to me there's there's people do different things here I always try to look at I'm going to try to identify the lower left hand point the lower left hand corner of all of these pixels okay that's what I'm going to try to do try to identify the lower left hand corner of every single one of these and if you notice they all have integer values right since these are all one between when I take the corner of these cells this one is one and Seven, okay. So that they all have they all have integer values for their, for uh, their these the, where these cells intersect. Now these guys here, where the the polygons are, they don't have integer values in general, okay. They don't have integer values. And so uh, what I'm going to do here is is, is I have to figure out how to um, how to kind of do this process, and we do this process typically by what's called edge trackers. Okay, we're going to set up a little tiny data structure element called an edge tracker. All right, and these edge trackers are going to monitor endpoints, the endpoints of these of this polygon, right, as it works its way through here. They're going to monitor the endpoints and go from one to another as we go down. Okay, 
And the edge trackers are going to contain two endpoints. And so if you look at a lot of computer graphics algorithms, right, at these low levels, at this very low level, we have an endpoint data structure, right? If you're doing it in C++, everybody has an endpoint class, okay? And we manage these endpoints, create and manage these endpoints as we go along. Um, now, the problem with this is that, that when you deal with a polygon like this is that you want to manage this endpoint going down this line for a while, and then you want to manage that endpoint going down that line for a while, and everything else. And it'd be easier if the polygons only had two endpoints to manage, right? So what everybody does is they split polygons up. Split your polygons into trapezoids. That look like this. We take a polygon, like this, and we split it up into trapezoids. Well, how? What we do is we at each one of these endpoints, what we do is we split this thing according to y value. Of course, if this is x to y down here, remember there's a z in the background always. But x to y here, we split these things going across here, like this. Uh, that's a straight line. We split these things like this. Okay, into, into trapezoids. I hope I did that correctly. Now, what's a trapezoid? A trapezoid has um, um, two parallel uh, lines and then two varying lines on the ends. Okay? And this is a trapezoid too, but it's, it's kind of trivially so. A triangle kind of is trivially a trapezoid because this horizontal line up on top has length zero. Okay? You can make it into a trapezoid easy. So all I have to do is, is kind of work my way top to bottom down through these polygons, okay, and split off the pieces into trapezoids. Okay, it's commonly what we do. The reason I do this is because for a particular trapezoid, if these lines are parallel to y, yeah, parallel to y values, then I only have to put two edge trackers, right, two endpoints to track the edges. Right over here, if I track the edges here down, all of a sudden I have to change right, my endpoint as I'm going and then change it down here and then I have to change it again over here, etc. And if we split them up first, we don't have to make those changes. That's what people do. So it's, it sounds kind of funny. You put in triangles and the very first thing you do is you split it up into trapezoids. You know, But it sounds kind of funny, but it's the way we do things here. And now let me show you here. Suppose you had a trapezoid. Let's get a grid here. Like this. And suppose you had a trapezoid here. Uh, like this. Suppose you had a trapezoid in here. What I'm going to do in the following thing is I'm going to set up a set of edge trackers that works down here. And I'm going to track these points. Like this. Okay? I'm going to track these points with my edge trackers. What my edge trackers are going to contain is the x, the y, and the z value of this point, okay? Um, and etc. As I move down, and I'll show you it's not too hard to set up these edge trackers to track them easily. I can show you that really quickly. Um, everybody know what uh, that is? That's the floor of X, which is? It's the biggest integer that's less than or equal to X, right? Okay? So strip off everything past the decimal point, take the integer. The biggest integer less than or equal to X. Okay? And so if I have this point here, right, to get to, uh, better example, if I have this point here, to get to that one there, Right? If this is x, y, z, all I'm going to do is take the floor of x, right? And it'll move me over to here. 
because I know these, these coordinates all have integer values. Right, so I can, I can kind of move around easily in here. So let's do an edge tracker. Let me show you an edge first. And um, let me do it this way. Here's a point x1, y1, z1 up here. Here's a point x2, y2, and z2 down here. Okay. And here's a uh, um, two consecutive scan lines like this. Okay. And I know a few things here, right? I know that this distance is one. Right, the distance between two consecutive scan lines is one, right? Over here, that's one. I know that this 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 length here is y one minus y two. I think it's that distance y one being higher, okay? Y two. This is x one minus x two, and there's there's. There's also a Z1 minus Z2 in here. I'm going to ignore, I mean, because it's really a 3D picture. I'm going to ignore that because it confuses everybody. Right? And this is something I'm going to call X inc. Right there. Okay? That's one's called X inc. It's not too hard to see that this triangle here and that triangle there are similar. Okay? And so you can write X inc over 1. Is equal is the same as x1 minus x2 all over y1 minus y2, right? X is the one as this is the this, right? Similar triangles. And so um, I'm going to define this x inc here, right? As um, right an increment I can add on to everything. So notice that this next scan line here. I drop this, this is 1. This one also has to be x inc, right? x inc is the same on every single one. Okay? Which is cool because in order to move the x value, suppose I start up here at this one, to move the x value to this one, all I need to do is decrease, or to move to this one, all I need to do is decrease y by 1 and subtract off x inc. Okay? And I get here, decrease y by 1, subtract off x inc. Decrease y by 1, subtract off x inc. So once I calculate x inc, I can move this endpoint tracker right, very easily from one scan line to the next. Going right down from one scan line to the next. So um, that's one. Okay. Notice that there's also a, um, down here there's also a z inc that I haven't, can I wave my hands at this one? There's also a Z inc down here, right? And this they, this has a Z2 minus Z1. Right? It's the change in Z. And it's not too hard to see that Z inc, you can also calculate a Z inc over 1, is equal to Z1 minus Z2 all over Y1 minus Y2. So given these two points, right, I can calculate these X inc and Z inc that move me Right, my x and y and z values from one to the another, to another. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Before this is before flattening. Oh, thank you for asking that question. Right, this is before flattening. Okay. Right, hang on. I'll show you what's going on here. Okay. All right. So everybody see that once I do this, right? Once I set up x inc and z inc. Right, I'm okay. Now this one up here, right, probably isn't on a nice scan line. Right, that point there isn't on the next scan line. But how do I find this first one? Right. Well, I know what x inc is, and I know I can figure out what the this proportion is here. Right, what the fraction, how far I've moved down. Right. And just that portion of x inc I'll add on to find the first point here, right? And I'll move down from y to the floor of y to get to here, okay? And it's easy right, to get to this first point. Once I get to this first point, bing, 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 bing. Now, normally there aren't eight scan lines. Normally there's a thousand, okay? So, I mean, this could be running, your polygons could be big, they could be running for several steps. 
here. Okay, so can I convince you that once I have this point and this point that I can figure out how to get to here? Right, and then to here is easy, to here is easy, to here is easy, etc. Okay? And so typically we have an endpoint node. We have an endpoint node, this endpoint data structure, containing x, y, z, x ink, and c ink that we set up. We don't need y ink because that's one. Okay? Y ink is always one. We're moving by one. And uh, I'll put down here other stuff. Okay? I'll show you what other stuff is in a minute. Okay? And then we manage these two endpoint nodes as we're working down the side. So the story is so far, we take a polygon in image space, split it up into trapezoids, okay, and we split it up by the y values, right, so that we get trapezoids out of it. Each one of these trapezoids, we define two endpoint nodes, right, which track down. And so now I'm at the point here where... Um, I'm at this point here, uh, these are all the same size, please use your imagination, okay? So I'm here, right, and here I've got some point x, y, and z that I've calculated from these x inks and everything else, and right? this comes from this very first point up here. Well, I really want to get to here, right? This is, I'm going to track the lower left-hand corner of each one of these things that intersects this guy. And I want to get to here. And how do I do that? Well, um, getting the x to here, right, you can see that um, this point here uh, is going to be equal to the floor of x and y in z and, oops, and something, right? But the y value is going to say the same, and it's an integer now, because it's on one of these scan lines. The x is going to be, I'm going to make it an integer, move it over here, okay? And then I have to calculate this, there's an increment on z that has to happen. And this increment is as I'm moving to the left, okay? Oops, to the right for you guys. The z has, is, is how I'm moving to the right. And I can calculate the z, uh, sort of, because what is the z? It's the increment as I go from one here to another. Okay? And if I know, if I have a normal vector to my trapezoid here, ah, here's a normal vector. If I have a normal vector that I can calculate to my trapezoid, it's a 3D thing, I can calculate a normal vector. Okay, and we'll use the old formula. Here's two points on my trapezoid, one here and one here. Okay, and here's a normal vector. Well, I know that the vector connecting these two points, okay, dotted with the normal vector of this plane, this, ve this vector is in the plane, dotted with the normal vector has to be zero. Give me that. Right? If this is a normal vector to this thing, now I, again I'm in I'm in image space, so there's this thing is tilted maybe, right? And there's a normal vector to it. So let's see. As I go from here to here, this vector is one in the x, zero in the y, right? Y doesn't change. One value in the x, and it's something I'm going to call z ink. The z value of this point on the polygon changes. And if there's a polygon in here, right, intersecting this grid and the z value changes slightly. This one dotted with this normal vector, like that, has to be zero. And if you look at this, you get nx, right, plus nz times z ink has to be zero. And you can see that, that z ink here has to be a minus nx over nz. Okay? Minus nx over nz. 
And so you can calculate this increment, this increment for z as you go across. So here's now, right? I've got these edge trackers going down. Each time I stop, I'm going to do, take the floor of x, right? Leave y alone, and I'm going to subtract off a little bit of z ink, right, to get to here. And then once I get to here, I can go across, 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 across. And eventually, I get x, y, and z coordinates that correspond to this polygon and image space, I get x, y, and z coordinates for every pixel. Hand up, scratching your head. Scratching your head, okay. All right? I get x, y, and z coordinates for every pixel. So I'm, I've, I can do this for each thing. Notice that the, oh, let's see. Uh, Got to be careful. What, what if nz is zero? If nz is zero, I'm in trouble, right? But if the normal vector z coordinate is zero, that normal vector has to, in our x, y, z space, right? If z is zero, that normal vector has to point, um, you know, the, the polygon is <laughs> kind of edge on, right, to your viewpoint, wherever you are. And then you don't want to view it anyway, right? So if, we usually have a check in here. If nz is zero, we forget about it, okay? Over here. If y1 equals y2, you're in trouble. But if y1 equals y2, this line is parallel to the uh, right to the y-axis, right? So you know, forget about that, and right? you don't have to worry about it. So this whole process is called scan conversion. The worst thing we have, the coolest thing about it, is you can do it all by these increments. Just add on these increments as you go, okay? And the worst thing you have to do is maybe a divide here to calculate the increments. The z ink, the increment across with z works for every single line, no matter what. So you only have to calculate it once. Works for every single line. And now I have, for every single polygon, I have an intersection point, right? Lower left-hand corner intersection point here for every single pixel that intersects the polygon, and then x, y, z. Okay. Now I explained the z buffer a little while ago. This is where the z buffer comes in. Because all of a sudden, for every one of these lower left hand corner points, I have an xyz for this polygon. Right? And I can compare that z against the value in the z buffer to see if this polygon is in front or behind. Okay? If it's in front, then I have things to do. If it's behind, I forget it. Okay? And so this is typically the way this scanline algorithm works. Okay? Now, that's the easy part. The interesting part is what's this other stuff here, okay? Because we integrate just about everything into this process. Uh, for example, um, typically when you write a uh, what we would call a renderer or something to draw graphics algorithms, we have to take these polygons and we have to move them into uh, into image space, okay? Typically what we do is we keep both the poly polygonal points around and the image space points around for any polygon, okay? The reason is the following, that if you're going to calculate, what you have to do is if you find something's out in front, you have to calculate the shading for that element. How do you do that? You use the Fong model that we we put up here on the board, okay? Well, that takes normals and vectors to light sources and everything else. But vectors to light sources happen not in image space. They happen back in the original space, okay? They happen back in the original space. And you can say, oh, well, that's cool. I'll just transfer my light source into image space, right? Well, what happens if your light source is behind the eye point? Right? It gets flipped over upside down and back. I mean, all of a sudden you have all these problems. And there are people that work out these light source equations in 4D, right? Most of us, when we write this, we don't. What happens is we take this point that we've calculated here, which happens to be on this polygon in image space, and we hit it with the inverse transform, reverse transform, and get it back to light, get it back to real space. Okay? We keep our image space points, uh, our real points is xyz, the image space points is xyzw, right? We transfer things back to image space and then we do our light source calculations back there, or in real space. We do our light source calculations back there, 
Okay, go ahead. Now, is this done after the scan line is done through the whole thing, or is it done as it's going across these? The answer to that question is yes, um, because it's been done both ways. Um, in the GPUs that we have, people do it both ways. When I write these things, I usually do it as I need it, right? So as I'm at the, each one of these points, I transfer back and look at it. I don't transfer all the points back at once and then try to do it per, per, per point. point, yeah. When I write it, it's easier in code to do that. When you have a parallel processor, though, it's easier to transfer a whole bunch of them back at once and do the whole, all the calculations at once that way. So it's, it's, the answer to the question is yes. It's done both ways, all right? So to do this, uh, you, okay? When you're using the inverse matrix to calculate that, how, I mean, this thing calculating a tension calculation inverse, like how does it like how much time does that take? Oh, no, the, the inverse actually is easy to, the inverse of the viewing matrix, um, you can calculate it yourself in about five minutes. It's because it's mostly zeros and ones, right? I mean, inverses are actually easy to calculate. Uh, when, when you get mostly zeros like that. You can calculate yourself in about five minutes. It's really easy to do. And in fact, I put, I put it out there on the web somewhere. And then calculating the camera, the camera part of the camera transform that gets you down to the, uh, the negative z-axis, that one is uh, also easy to invert. You just do the backwards things. So actually, these things are actually pretty easy to invert. And we go back and forth here quite a bit. The other thing we do is that for each one of these coordinates here, we can specify, for example, um, texture coordinates for each one of these. Okay, so for each one of these coordinates, there could be a uh, we'll call, uh, there could be not only an X Y Z, but there could be an R G B and a few others, and texture coordinates U and V. Right? These things can get complex. Okay. Now. Um, one of, the, one of the ways is, uh, let's see, uh, I'll do these one at a time. If you have Garo shading, right, what does Garo shading do? Garo shading takes an RGB and puts it at each one of these vertices. Okay? So not only do I have an XYZ, right, at each one of them, but I have an RGB. And, and potentially I have a U and V, which is a texture coordinate also at these. And what do I do? Well, what I do is I set up, as I'm moving along here, not just X inks and Z inks as I go down. I, this is linear interpolation. I set up R links and G, R ink, G ink, B ink, U ink, and V inks, right, in this endpoint data structure. This is what I mean by other stuff, okay? And I increment those as I go down too. And so at each point, what I get is a linearly interpolated value of each one of these things. And then as I go across, I linearly interpolate them also. Not only do I do Z inks going across, but I have Z, I have R inks, G, B, B, G, and links, inks going across also. So I have all these increments going up and down, not just X and Z. I have all these increments that are being added. Worst, thing, worst case is I'm adding, all right? These machines do that real well. Okay, do this very, very well. And I can increment all these things going across. So for Garo shading, this thing works really beautifully. Okay? Sometimes I have to take normal vectors and I have to plot normal vectors here and I, the normal vectors are from the <laughs> original space. I carry them in, right? And I use the normal vectors and I plot them as I go across. Okay? So the scan conversion process is something it gives you at each point of your polygon in image space. It gives you a Z value, right, which you can use in the Z buffer. It gives you an RGB, right, which you can use in which you can use to color the thing, and it gives you a texture coordinate in case you have to look, use a texture lookup to establish the color. And so with all of this, right, all we this is going on underneath, right, way down below in the system. Right, all of these things, we try to do as much in graphics as we can with these linearly interpolated things because it's the way the GPUs operate. And it's really kind of cool. If you notice, that the worst math I did today was like a divide. Okay? It's really kind of cool. Um, the key is you transfer it from this image space that we have to this device space where everything's real nice. Um, 
If you don't transfer to device space, all these uh, equations get messy, okay? Because a lot of the things here, I assumed that I had a one. Okay, if I didn't have a one here, if these things were different units apart, right, I would have to have all these other things. So the equations get really nice in here because they're one unit on a side. And off we go, okay? And so most of us in graphics learn how to do scan conversion at some point, okay? It's one of the simplest algorithms that's out there. And it's a bookkeeping algorithm. All you have to do is, right? It's a bookkeeping of all this information. Being that it's a bookkeeping algorithm, when I, whenever I hear that phrase, bells and whistles go off in my head because they're usually the single most difficult algorithms to debug around. That if you don't, if you get a minus sign incorrect or something incorrect, right, all these fractions go off and your stuff looks cr just crazy. Okay, program works just fine, but your stuff looks crazy. Okay, and trying to find the bugs in these algorithms is really, really difficult. Now, um, I have a renderer in my office that uh, does exactly this thing. Okay, and other stuff here I think is 105 different variables that we track, which is uh, which enables us to make really good, good, very, very nice images out. But we track 105 different variables. But again, we track them all by just adding increments on as we go. Um, and uh, this, this whole thing has been around since the late 60s, actually, so since people first started this. They first started converting these things over and doing scan line by scan line on TVs. Okay? This whole algorithm has been around from the late 60s. It really hasn't changed much at all. Okay? It really hasn't changed much at all. Um, there was a, an algorithm, uh, uh, um, a guy named Watkins at the University of Utah that said um, in the old TV days, hey, hold it, why do we do each individual polygon and do these, these edge endpoint nodes? Why don't we do all the polygons at once per scan line? Right, so think about this in your head. You're going to do all the polygons at once. So you can convert them all to trapezoids, right? And then take all these trapezoids and figure out which ones intersect this scan line. And for each one of those things, put up endpoint nodes for them. Okay? Now, you can see this list of endpoint nodes. Right? It's huge. Okay? But we can order these endpoints by X, for example. Right? We can order them all, sort them by X, and then look in the intervals in between these two. It has to be all one color or one object in those intervals. And we can tell a lot. And he was able to take this algorithm, which is called Watkins' algorithm now in the trade, right, and do this. And all it is is managing a list of these, of these endpoint nodes. They're almost identical to what we have today. The cool thing about it is you can move down to the next scan line really easy. All you have to do is go through the endpoint nodes and add on all the increments. And ka-chunk, you're down to, one, to the next scan line to examine. Okay. Now what he noticed was, well, maybe, there might, maybe there's a couple more endpoints you have to add, or maybe a couple drop off, or something like this, this big list. But when you get done with this, right, and oh, you know, if you add on these increments, a couple of these things aren't sorted anymore, they could switch. But you could use a very nice simple sort to sort this, all these nodes going across, called a bubble sort. Everybody uses a bubble sort here because it works great on things that are almost sorted. And this thing is, it's, if you look at these scan lines, right, that is going down, they're almost sorted every single iteration. Okay, and he, he devised this very, very clever algorithm to handle all these endpoints, right? Get one scan line at a time. So it's kind of like, rather than doing for every polygon generate endpoints, it's for every scan line generate endpoints for all the polygons that intersect that scan line and go from there. So this algorithm has been around forever, right? And most of us eventually, when we work in graphics, we have to code it up for some reason. Right? There's a time we have to do some kind of scan conversion. We have to code this thing up. And it's an irritating algorithm to code you up, code up, so I'm not going to make you do it. Right? Because it's it's so bloody simple, but it's one for some reason it's one where everybody has a problem getting this thing to actually work. Right? Because if you know, if if you do if, if your loop does one extra thing here, right, you get 
all these nice pixels out here cover colored for your polygon, and you don't want that. Okay, um, you know, and it might obscure some other pixels that you have and foul up the Z buffer, and uh, people end up with cracks between their polygons because they don't hit it go over enough, and you know, it's just a it's a really tough algorithm to get. But you should be aware the scan conversion thing is here. All it is is setting up these increments and adding these increments on. It's done at a very, very low level in every graphics processor that's out there. right? It's done in parallel. It's really cool in parallel. And uh, can be done very quickly. Now this might be talking to, about the elephant in the room, but what about anti-aliasing? Um, most of, now, what, what anti-aliasing is for those of you is that we're coloring squ squares here, right? If we color squares, right, our polygon tends to look like where is it? Okay, a straight line here with a little bit at top, and you know, if we just color squares, right, and you get these jagged edges off squares. If you have a line. Even if you have a thousand dots on the screen, if you have a line that's nearly vertical or nearly horizontal, it goes straight and then it goes boing and it goes over. Right? You see it. And your eye picks up this, this unfortunate thing. Anti-aliasing is something that tries to make that transition smooth. Okay? And there's been probably three, four thousand papers written on this uh, to do anti-aliasing to try to figure out exactly how much of this whole square does this thing cover and only color, if it only colors half the square, then take the color that you calculated and only use half of it, for example. Okay. And in my hundred and odd things and other stuff, I keep, one of the things I keep is information to do exact calculations at the edges. Okay. And uh, that's one of the things that, that I put in. Um, normally, um, we have various ways to try to get uh, um, a better color at each pixel. One of the ways to do better color at each pixel is if you've got a thousand by a thousand screen, right? Do this algorithm, but at four thousand by four thousand, okay? And then what you get is for every pixel, you get sixteen little samples, right, of color. Average those. Right? And you get an average thing. And this algorithm turns out to be so fast that average, actually doing it at double the resolution or quadruple the resolution isn't bad. And we can do it that way. There's all kinds of ways to do this. But in animation, these, these little anti-alias things make, make uh, it look like little figures are running around the edges of your, of your objects. If you try to animate them, this, this jagged edge it comes up and you, that edge moves a little bit. Well, the jag moves a little bit too, and it looks like somebody's running around the edges of your of your uh, objects, uh, which is really irritating. But you know, many of us try to do it by uh, doing it extra. You can actually tell the GPU to do this at double the resolution, for example, and it will try to do it for you. Um, so that's that's one of the ways we try to do it. But there's, there's uh, many of these things. And I'll show you how to do it. We do it in ray tracing by ray tra tracing way too many rays, right? And then averaging over the things. So I got a question in back. So is that what the different settings of anti-aliasing means, like the 4x and the 16x? Yep. That the That's what it means. Yeah. Effectively, yes. Okay. <laughs> ATI does is a little different than NVIDIA, does it a little different than whatever. Okay. But those are the things. So, so this is scan conversion. Uh, on Friday, I'm going to do surfaces, right? I'll show you how to do surfaces, and uh, and Bezier surfaces and things like that, uh, which will help you out on this next assignment a bit, and uh, we will go from there. So I will see you next time. <laughs>